This week, we're actually going to talk about the Lord's Prayer, which is found here in uh, John chapter 17. It is, truly, it takes up 26 verses of his prayer, and you see the outline there in your bulletin. If you look this morning, in his prayer, it's 26 verses, he spends about five verses praying for himself, and then he prays uh, about five verses, excuse me, he prays what, 15 verses or thereabouts for the saints that were in his day there, the disciples we might call them. And then finally he prays for us, which I would say are the seed. Okay, so he prayed for the saint, for himself, he prayed for the saints, and he prayed for the seed or the future saints, which we would fall into that category. Let's go ahead and read uh, the entire chapter and then we'll come back and try to break it apart. Again, I don't have my glasses, so if I miss a word, forgive me. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now... I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them by thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee. And these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil, from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Seems like he said that two or three times now. I think it must be important. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Here's where he's getting to us. We are those who believe on Christ through the word of the disciples. That all they may be as one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one. There's another thing he said several times. I think that must be important. Even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect, that's complete, in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast, thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I 
in them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would uh, help me to break this text apart tonight, Lord. I pray that you would teach us something. Lord, I pray above all that we would be drawn closer to thee and that we would be one and that we would be separate from the world and that we would manifest thy love. That seems to be three very important uh, aspects of the word there lord that we be unified in you and that we be manifesting thy love and that we be separate from the world i pray you'd start with this preacher and help us to be those things lord but i know there are other things that we can glean from your prayer as not only encouragement but as examples for us in our prayer life lord and i pray that you would work in us and through us Draw us closer to thee. Lord, I, I pray again, if there be one here that doesn't know you, that today would be the day of their salvation. We love you, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so he prayed for himself. If you look back in the first uh, five verses, Jesus is praying for himself. Let's read those again. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given me power that's authority over all flesh that he should give he, give it him he's speaking in third person in that verse as thou hast given him or given jesus given me he would could say power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him in other words in one way that jesus is glorified he's praying for the salvation of people he's praying for souls saved uh, he's he's thanking God here. Let's look at verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. How did he glorify God? I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So he's asking God to save souls, and he's praising God by his work that he did. And then look in verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. As a, as a missionary, um, you, you, you can't, no, nobody can truly understand what Christ gave up because none of us have seen it, right? As a missionary, we have a little, just a little idea of it because we leave what we know, whom we know, and we go abroad. And you go through, Denise and I were kind of chuckling about a, a missionary kid that was at at Bible college with her and you know whatever you're used to you think that's the only way right and so um, you take Bo and CJ have been here long this is really all they know they just have snapshots of memory of other places that we've been and when you talk about how somebody else does something you just immediately as a human you think how bizarre or maybe even how stupid or sometimes how wrong that is and some things are wrong clearly and some things are not necessarily wrong they're just different but the bible college kid that had grown up on the mission field and all this person could talk about at bible college was how great the mission field was that she had grown up on and how terrible our country is even though you know she was supported by various church her parents were by various churches from here all she knew was that country and she was just forever uh talking about how great that country was and really it was taken as arrogance and how great her country was but really what she was in the midst of was culture shock right she missed what she was familiar with she missed whatever that was i wasn't there so i'm not really privy to the conversation i can imagine how it was taken as arrogance but she just missed home you know missionary kids are kind of weird uh, by design even though i don't think it's the fault of the parents or anything but they don't really fit in on the mission field because they're not from there and they don't really fit in here because they're not from here and so then they don't really fit in anywhere, right? So it's kind of odd. And so you kind of go through the whole homesickness thing. When you're on the foreign field, you miss home. And when you're home, you, you miss home over there. It's kind of a difficult thing. But the point is, Jesus is saying here, basically, Lord, I miss you. I miss our intimacy. I miss the oneness that we had. Because he laid aside all of that to come here. You just think of it, you know. I don't know where Riley and Clay were born. 
I can tell you where each of my four were born, and all of them were born in the nicest hospital available. Jesus, who came from a land, as I understand the scripture, that uses what we consider very valuable as pavement, right? And was born in a barn, you know? That he's praying that the Lord would renew their union like it was before the incarnation, before he came to earth. He prayed for the salvation. He thanked the Lord. He completed the job. Obviously, a little prophecy there because part of the work was on the cross. So to in Jesus' mind, it was already accomplished because he said on the cross, it's finished, right? But here he said, I've accomplished. I've finished the work you've given me to do. So he prayed for himself, prayed for the salvation of souls, he prayed for his own service, and he prayed for that reunion of oneness between he and the Lord. Then in verses 6 to 19, he prays for the saints that were there at that time. Verses 8 to 10, he's basically praying for them because they're his. God gave them to him, and he kept them. Uh, in verse 11, he prays that they would have the same unity. And now I'm no more in the world. So look, he's still in the world. He hadn't been to the cross yet. He hadn't resurrected yet. He hadn't ascended yet. But in his mind... Boom, it's already done. Just like when we read Ephesians 2, Kendra, it says that we are sitting together in heavenly places with God. So we're as sure for heaven as if we were already there. He was as sure to ascend and be at the right hand of the Father as if he had already been to the cross, been to the grave, got the keys to death and hell, and rose again. He knew it was going to happen. So he's already saying, I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. So he's praying for their unity. The church is to be unified. If, if Janice is listening to the Holy Spirit and Jerry is listening to the Holy Spirit and Denise and Randy and John and Kendra and Chris and Jake and Christy and Michael and Karen and Charles and Ashley and Kayla are all listening to the Holy Spirit, we'll be one. Because the Spirit can't be contrary against the Spirit. When there is division in the church, that's when one or more of us are listening to our flesh rather than listening. And Christ is praying here for there to be unity. I told Denise on the way to church, I was talking about this morning a, a little church. The fellow's been there about two and a half years. He started with about 17 people, and the Lord's really blessed. They had 75, 76 the last few weeks, and just he's thrilled about that. He told me something, and... and <laughs> That tickled me. And it's unity's important. I think we see that all through this text here. And this is a rabbit trail, but I'll shoot it in a minute and get back to the sermon. Uh, Miss Karen, he said that there were two ladies that were coming to church together, okay? And they were sitting together, they were friends, and had some kind of falling out. And so then the one lady is sitting up here on the second or third row, and the other lady's still back there on the back. Like, you know, that's the 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 Sims Marshall corner back there, got the back row down, you know. Uh, and come to find out this lady that's sitting up front she's going to move someplace else so the other lady sent the pastor word Miss Janice that he would come she would come back to church when the other lady moved now come on that's pretty petty right where is the lordship in that where is the unity where is the forgiving spirit that we're supposed to have remember Jesus said by this shall all men know you my disciples if you have love one toward another he didn't talk about our denomination though I'm proud to be a Baptist he didn't talk about our doctrine though I think our doctrine is very important he didn't even talk about our dress though I like to look like a preacher when I'm preaching amen it's our demeanor our love all right now the preacher tickled me because he sent her word back said if that's the way you feel I don't think we need you messing up the spirit we got. You just stay at the house. <laughs> I got a kick out of that now. I don't. I told Denise, I said, I know how he felt, but I was kind of surprised he actually said it, you know. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> verse 12, he prayed for, for the saints to be steady in the trenches, if you will. Look at verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. And those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. 
Basically, in verse 12 there, he's preaching that, hey, look, Lord, I have, Father, I have kept these people that you've given me, these souls that you've given me, I've kept them, and I, they're faithful, they're steady, and he's praying for them to remain steady in the trenches or faithful in the trenches. In verse uh, 13 there, he prays for our joy. He said, I'm come that you might have joy and that your joy might be full, right? So he's praying for us to be joyful. I know that different people have different uh, personalities, you know. We have people, y'all, did y'all ever watch Winnie the Pooh very much? Do you know the characters on Winnie the Pooh? Of course, Emma does because she lives at our house. She's got her hand raised. Well, Denise and I often say, well, that person's kind of an Eeyore, right? Because it, it, everything's bad in Eeyore's world. Well, they probably wouldn't like me anyway. You know, everything's bad in Eeyore. And Tigger's just bouncing from you know thing to thing. And he's just, uh, Tigger's are happy, you know. Tigger's are just always bouncing. But yet if we're saved, an Eeyore is not going to become a Tigger. But an Eeyore can be less, you know what I'm saying? Jesus wants us to have joy. And sometimes, okay, the world has joy in the absence of problems. Like the world has peace in the absence of problems. But Jesus is praying for us to have joy. Now, I believe he said, he's talking about us being in the world, right? He said, in the world ye shall have what? Tribulation. And yet, he wants us to be joyful. We can have joy, and he's prayed for us to have joy. Now, in verse 17, he's praying for us to be sanctified. Sanctify them through thy word, through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What does it mean to be sanctified? Well, that's set apart. He wants us to be different. Channing said in Sunday school this morning, uh, peculiar, that's the word that, that Peter uses in his writing. So Christ prayed for himself. And, and basically his service to the Lord. And then he prayed for the saints. And then starting in verse 19, he begins to pray for the seed, which includes us. Look, as thou hast sent me into the world, verse 18, even so I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself. So Christ set himself apart to go to the cross for our sakes. The Bible says that also in Hebrews, that they also might be sanctified through their through the truth. So he wants us to be set apart to do his service. You know, the Great Commission, a lot of people, I hear lots, the, the, the devotional this morning, it broke the Great Commission into three parts, right? Evangelize, baptize, and what was the last one? I know what it is, but what was the wording they used? It was educate. I was thinking it ended in eyes. Evangelize, edu you know, whatever. I, I didn't. I couldn't think of educate with the eyes on the end of it. You know what I'm saying? I thought it all rhymed, but I, I always heard it broken up into four things: go, win, baptize, teach. You go. You can't do it if you don't go. You win people to the Lord. You baptize those that are one to the Lord, and you teach them to observe all things whatsoever. And basically, everybody in the world falls into one of those. Four categories. Either nobody's told them, or they've been told but not one, or they've been one but not baptized, or they've been baptized but not taught. Everybody fits into those four categories. <clears throat> and uh, we should be have our minds set to be set apart to carry that out. Everybody thinks that the Great Commission is like, okay, you either go, give, or pray. In all reality, I think we all should be going, we all should be giving, and we all should be praying, okay? So maybe I'm not in Iceland right now. Obviously, I'm not in Iceland right now, right? Uh, maybe I'm not on any mission field that we would think of as a mission field, and yet there's a little bitty Missionary Baptist Church in North Port, Alabama. And when you right there where that clock is, they have a sign up. You are now entering the mission field. It doesn't matter where we are, we need to be set apart. The Great Commission was not given to preachers who were going to go to the foreign field. The Great Commission was given to the local church. It's true, the Sunday school lesson said a call to preach is a call to prepare, but everybody has a call to service. And Jesus is praying for us to be set apart to that service. Basically, it's not you either go 
or you give so somebody else can go, it's while you're going, win, baptize, teach, or evangelize, baptize, and edumacize, all right? We, we got to do it while we're going. In other words, I say this all the time, and I'm going to keep saying it, Lord willing, but it doesn't matter if we're doing survey work or if we're doing education work or if we're doing uh, dirt work, whatever we're doing, insurance work, whatever we're doing, we're supposed to be evangelists, set apart to carry out the Great Commission. Uh, look in verse 22. In verse 21, he prayed for the unity. In verse 22, it says... Uh, the glory which thou hast given me, I have given unto them that they may be one even as, as we are one. The glory. How is the church glory? Well, honestly, I think we're glory, which means bright, shining, when we are one in Christ, and he's given us that glory. But at the same time, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, I believe, that unto him be glory in the church throughout all generations. That's Holman's paraphrase. That's not the exact words of Scripture. But the church is glorified when she's unified. And when she's unified and, and evangelizing and baptizing and edumacizing, then she's glorifying Christ. And he's praying for our unity. And then look, in verse 22 that we can reflect his glory and in verse 26 I'm coming in for a landing in verse 26 he said I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them we talked about it a second ago John I can't remember if it's in John 15 12 or John 13 35 but anyway he says that everybody knows we are his disciples by our love. And all we're doing is reflecting his love. Just reflecting his love. So Christ prayed for us. He prayed for himself. He prayed for the saints. And then he prayed for us or the seed of it. Doesn't that remind us of how we should pray? We should pray for ourselves that we would see souls saved, that we would complete the work that he has, that we would be one with Christ. Should we not pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ? I've tried to do it during during this, you know, 20 or so days I've been going. But <clears throat> honestly, I, and here's I understand scripture, we should do it every day. How long does it take, especially with the church our size, how long does it take to take to, to name every member by name? And ask for God to work in their life. Ask for God to be glorified in them. Ask for them to have unity of the Spirit. Ask for them to be steady in the trenches. Ask for them to have joy. Ask for them to be sanctified in the truth. How long does it take for us to pray not only for those of us who are here, but for the people that each of us are trying to reach? Everybody in here has got somebody in mind that they're trying to reach. And we need to lift one another up the way Christ lifted us up. I think that, <clears throat> well, it doesn't matter what I think because I've heard you say it. I've heard you say it, and I've heard you say it. I've heard scores of Christians from different groups say that our biggest weapon that we never pull out is prayer. We always try to work it out in our own way. I think, Denise and I were talking about it on the way home because, you know, praying something specific for Ashley. I've asked Ashley, Ashley to pray something specific for me. And sometimes we're in these situations and we're going, God, get me out of this. Get me out of this. Please get me out of this. And we're not giving him requests, right? We're giving him answers. This is what we want. Give us this. And sometimes the answer is apparently no. And maybe it's because when we're in that situation, I'm just guessing here, Randy. I don't know. I'm not omniscient. I don't know everything. But I think sometimes the Lord puts at least John Stuart Hallman in positions because if I'm in this position and I'm counting on him for literally the next day, which is how he tells us to pray, right? Give us this day our daily bread. If I'm, if I'm so dependent upon him because of the situation I'm in, maybe he put me there 
so I would be dependent upon him and not be dependent upon me, you know. Well, that's hard for me to hear because I'm, I'm not the most organized person in the world, but I really do try to think ahead on everything. And I, I want to know what I'm going to do next month and next year. But sometimes the Lord puts us in a situation so that we'll pray like this. And yet, we're in this situation and sometimes I fall guilty. I don't know about you. I can't. I, I don't follow you all around. I don't know how often you pray. But I fall guilty of not calling on him even after he's put me in a position where he's not my last choice. He's my only choice, right? We've got to call on him in prayer. Pray for ourselves. Pray for our fellow saints. And pray for the seed of those that we're trying to reach.